the third day of our face-to-face -face conference. And without further ado, let me hand over uh, to Witold Mrozek, uh, a journalist of Gazeta Wyborcza Daily, who will be the moderator of this meeting. Hello, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm so happy to be able to meet you here in Teatr Powszechny. Our guest is Klementyna Zuhanov, a writer, researcher, activist, reporter, a fighter for women's rights, and a woman fighting for democracy, for human rights, for the rule of law. Our point of departure is Clementina's book, This is War, Women, Fundamentalists, and the New Middle, I Middle Ages. Indeed, this is a very important book, uh, giving us a global perspective on the perfect storm and the right-wing organizations uh, very often linked to authoritarian regimes, like in Russia. It talks about the tentacles of these organizations, which for over two decades have been operating in Poland. The key point of reference is Ordo Juris for you. That's an organization, a right-wing organization operating in Poland, the Institute of Legal Culture Ordo Juris. They call themselves right-wing think tank. The members of that organization include members of the parliament, uh, deputy ministers, and many public servants. But it's not the only organization of that uh, kind. There are other organizations like the Institute of Freedom, for instance, who is responsible for allocating funds for NGOs in Poland. Ordo Iuris used to be a very active organization and very impactful, very influential. However, the very title of the book, This is War, it's a quote from Alexei Komov, a person related to the World uh, Congress of uh, Families, uh, that Clementina had a chance to uh, meet uh, in Russia after the invasion of Crimea and Donbass. She talked to him last year. And for starters, before we get into details, before we give the Polish context uh, for our foreign audience, I would like to start with a question. Global right-wing circles linked to pro-Kremlin organizations in Russia. What did they lose as a result of uh, Russia becoming a pariah internationally? Uh, Russia is a pariah in the eyes of the international public. Good afternoon. Well, I think that you touched upon a very interesting topic. Even the sanctions from 2014 imposed on different oligarchs did not prevent the American right wing to be in touch with Russia, Kremlin, and all the organizations that support and co-organize different right wing, extremely religious events. Back then, even though this was the first shot, first event when sanctions were imposed, which was an unprecedented feat on the political arena. Back then, however, the contacts were not broken off. A year later, the World Congress of Families was supposed to happen. This is the main platform bringing together all the right-wing organizations, and the Congress took place in September 2014. Despite the sanctions, the name was different, but the guests were the same, the presentations were the same, the financing bodies were the same. Well, there was a Polish organization. Yes. Yes. We as Poles, we have um, our representation in the organization. 
from the very beginning, and now I'm taking a very close look at how the situation develops. I decided to focus on Ordo Juris in Poland, but I'm uh, trying to be up to date with what is happening elsewhere. Both Ordo Juris and the World Congress of Families are very interesting and complex organizations. Both these organizations have, since March last year, been complaining of not having money. And that's symptomatic. It's interesting. Until then, they've always enjoyed lots of money. And suddenly, starting March 2022, they are complaining that they have trouble getting funds. They were always saying that they got individual donations from people supporting them, which was not true, of course. They said that suddenly the people ceased to support them, suddenly in March 2022. It's the coincidence is telling both organizations experiencing financial problems in exactly the same time perspective. I don't know what uh, explanation I could give you. I don't know what the donations looked like before. I'm sure it was not just a regular bank transfer from Kremlin to that organization. We have just fragmented knowledge. Sometimes uh, money came from um, Azerbaijan, from some money laundering institutes. Money from Azerbaijan was uh, linked to a, a Russian arms dealer. There was Russian money behind it. We would know that uh, exhibitions, conferences were financed. They, they adore conferences. Uh, Imagine a conference is taking place. There are just two people in the audience representing that organization, but they can write about it. For instance, a debate was organized in the Polish parliament uh, by Ordo Juris. There were just two people attending this debate, but they have some news that they can share in social media, attesting to the fact that they are a, pop a serious organization able to organize debates in the parliament, in the European parliament, you name it. That's a way to cheat their partners, actually. The sanctions this time most likely cut off their source of money. They have to go to great lengths to get money in the current situation. They seemingly support Ukraine, but they are non-stop visiting Budapest. Budapest right now is a substitute for Moscow. In the past, they would go to Moscow all the time. Right now, they are continuously in Budapest. Changes are happening, but uh, we don't know whether that would weaken the organizations definitely. definitely. To give you a broader context, Putin's invasion, the full-scale invasion on Ukraine in February 2022 was, in many respects, a surprise for the Polish right wing. For years, not only Ordo Juris, uh, as an organization that was consciously taking care of its image, image of a radical, threatening organization, a dangerous one, but it came as a surprise also to a number of uh, journalists belonging to the right-wing um, circles, uh, writing for a number of uh, right-wing magazines every single day. All these people have for years been saying that Russia is an example of a conservative country that resists Western rottenness, a decay of family values. To what extent was that inspired? And by Russia when it comes, for instance, to Polish homophobia. Well, the Polish case is specific. It's, it's very different to what is happening in the international arena. With all its history, Poland is considered to be a Russophobic country by Russia, of course. There are many diagrams uh, shown but the sentiment towards Russia and Poland is the most negative. 
so it would be totally impossible to have pro-Russian organizations operating in Poland. Having a pro-Russian agenda means that you're bound to fail here. But for some time now, we've had in our Polish parliament politicians who openly promote pro-Russian narratives. So it is feasible, it is possible, but the closer it was to the Ukrainian war, the more likely we were to really notice it. We would talk about uh, genocide in the Volynia region, accounting for the past. That's so very much right-wing uh, final settlements with the neighbors, with the neighboring nations, who did wrong to whom. Now it's very visible. On the one hand, it's an area where such organizations uh, have problems operating, but at the same time, the Polish anti-Russian sentiment is not able to spot at the right time all the Russian impulses that are present here, especially the propaganda, the ideology. We have this strong sensation that there are no Russians in Poland. After eight, 1989, they just said, oh, we are disappearing from history. You are so cool. Keep on doing what you're doing on your own. When the Soviet army left Poland, the phenomenon ceased to exist. At the same time, we don't have, no, we have no counterintelligence in Poland. It was uh, destroyed practically by one of the former ministers of national defense who disclosed the list of our uh, agents. I know that, for instance, in Brussels, uh, there were loads of uh, Russian spies being uh, uh, arrested after the outbreak of the war. There was even a purge in many countries in Europe. In Poland, there was nothing like that. The press doesn't write about Polish, uh, about Russian spies being apprehended in Poland. Our neighbors, the Czech Republic, recently arrested a number of Russian spies. So in Poland, strange things are happening. We have uh, somehow a distorted image of the reality. It's hard to call things by their names. And for a long time, people who like me, who were researching pro-Russian phenomena, were considered to be half madmen when the war broke out. It became much more visible also for laymen. Right now, I don't hear that often that what I'm writing about are conspiracy theories. Our previous work is very useful because we are able to give more details to what is happening right now in Ukraine. My topic, for instance, is closely linked to Ukraine. Ukraine used to be a test ground before the conservative ideas started to be promoted in the West. Together with uh, former Soviet republics, it was a kind of testing area. Before the tactics of infiltration was fine-tuned. Poland is a very strange place. Strange things happen here. It's hard to talk about them abroad. Oftentimes, we are misunderstood. It's hard for people to understand the Polish context. And indeed, we have uh, different mobs operating here. Some things have been identified in the past, even under the previous government. We had organizations that would organize anti-Ukrainian rallies financed by the same oligarch who finances similar organizations in the West. He's trying to do business in Donbass region, building his business holding there. At the same time, the fact that I'm here allows me to connect the dots. I see what is happening in Ukraine. I see what is happening in Russia. Poland is a kind of conveyor belt. Certain operations related to infiltration of, uh, for instance, anti-abortion 
groups, the good old former anti-abortion groups stemming from the 1980s, 1990s, small organizations of you know old ladies were the first tool, the first ground for infiltration. It happened in Poland. I described it in my book. I was able to connect the dots. Sorry to interrupt you. And my first question is, well, you write about an important topic in your book. You write about the World Youth Day that happened more or less at the term of time of the political change in Poland. Was that the fertile ground for such work? Well, as we know, communist countries were by definition atheist countries. That's why in 1989 we had many organizations from the U.S. coming over here to evangelize the Eastern Europe to infiltrate Russia. Oftentimes these were organizations that would come here with their shows, performances, for instance, uh, Graham's performances in Moscow. It was uncharted territory for evangelization. A lot happened in the 1990s. And we had the Pope, John Paul II, coming from Poland, and hence Poland became the center of evangelization. Of course, we were a Catholic country. Catholicism was very strong here back then, and we became the center of operations, not knowing actually that you know the story back in the 1990s with the strong figure of John Paul II would become the be beginning of another story for Russian services. John Paul II would def saying that John Paul II was also the target of many Russian uh, services. More or less in the middle of the 1990s, we would see the beginning of another operation of Russian services targeted at the West, and it was all sparked by John Paul II. Paradoxically, it was as if a drop was hitting the rock, and then Russians decided to use the conservative channel for their purposes because they found it suitable. They started constructing so-called um, international organization. Right now we have lots of uh, documents. For instance, Mikhail Khodorkovsky's organization based in London. We know that it's a targeted operation. Getting into conservative milieus was happening at the same time with infiltration of nationalist parties in the EU. Even a name was coined. It was called the Alt in Time, right wing international movement. So it was called alternative inter uh, well in your book not only speak of the Russian topic but also the Latin American thread starting in Brazil that allows us directly to trace the institutional foundations of the TFP movement that stands behind Ordo Juris. Could you comment on that? Well, we have to go back in history again to the beginnings of the Cold War. In the Latin America, it was all happening in the context of the Cuban Revolution. The entire right wing of Latin America is concerned that the revolution might spread. The same happens in Brazil. Wealthy people Organ, uh, establish an organization called uh, Tradition Family uh, Ownership, uh, Ownership Propiedad. Uh, I think that it was always for them the most important thing uh, 
It was actually to mobilize the wealthiest groups to defend their status of ownership against any potential revolution that would mean end of their wealth. An organization was created based on old-fashioned, outdated me medieval hierarchy with dreams of bringing Middle Ages back. The leader of the organization left some legacy where he writes that the 20th century is tainted, sexual revolution was bad, World War II was bad, the World War I was bad because it gave voting rights to women, but actually French Revolution was bad, Enlightenment was bad, and the only good world order stems from the Middle Ages because there you would have the master, the peasant, and everything was clear and uh, power was bestowed by God. Well, let me give you a side remark, a similar view. For instance, combating Luther's uh, ideology, uh, 600 later on, uh, are uh, proposed by Mr. Paweł Lisicki, who writes for Do Rzeczy. It's a magazine sponsored by the state uh, treasury. This magazine would, for instance, uh, uh, have special editions uh, sponsored by the Ministry of uh, uh, Justice about crimes uh, because of LGBT ideology. So, indeed, the root of all e evil is modernity, and it's part of the public media sphere in Poland. Uh, what about Piotr Skargia Association and all that? These are uh, our internal stories, but that's why we referred to the Brazilian organization. Since the 60s of the uh, 19th, 20th century, they created such organization that uh, uh, actually is still um, active nowadays. Communism was abolished, and communism was one of the main uh, enemies uh, in Brazil. And uh, they internally, after abolishment of uh, um, communism, Pinio de Rivera um, made his last will saying that the next goal target of this organization is fight against abortion. So he came up with certain targets around, and topics, and this organization nowadays is organized and structured around these topics. And in Poland, not only in Poland, however, in many other countries, in Belgium, in the, in the Netherlands, uh, Croatia, uh, they are active as well, in France as well, in Spain, in the United States. Uh, this organi these Brazilian organizations uh, established kind of uh, subsidies and uh, subsidiaries, and they have different names: uh, uh, tradition, family, and ownership. They uh, took uh, different names. Uh, in the U.S., they uh, have the same name. In Poland, however, their organization is called Piotr Skarga Organization. Piotr Skarga is a very old school person, 16th century. And in the way uh, of communication uh, media, that's not actually to be read by the contemporary person. That's why they created Ordo Juris Contemporary um, Organization that is perfectly using social media. They have great PR, they know how to communicate, uh, public speech, etc. So they're perfect in that. They make a lot of rumors around themselves, and they are just an arm, a contemporary arm of this organization uh, to make their work. What do you believe, uh, uh, how these ideas uh, have been translated for the recent 15 years uh, or 20 years into the mainstream of the Polish Catholic Church, Episcopal bishops, uh, priests? Uh, because I remember the first time I uh, have uh, experienced the active uh, action of Association of Pitskarga when I studied in Krakow, that was in 2005, six more or less. And back then, they organized a huge poster campaign against one of the first um, um, equality parade. And uh, back then in Krakow, we had many posters signed by the Catholic uh, Association uh, named after Piotr Skarga. Many posters. Uh, Krakow, uh, the uh, city of the Pope or the city of since. And uh, back then, 
of the city of perverts. And um, I remember the uh, church in Krakow, they said, uh, we are against these posters, and they said it is not, po they should not, they are not allowed to use the, uh, ver the um, uh, adjective Catholic. In nowadays in Polish church it wouldn't be possible. Yeah, yeah, but we always have this, always have this kind of uh, room in Polish church when uh, um, uh, th that acts like a sect. There is always a part of people who is uh, happily absorbing this kind of uh, messages and knowledge. But indeed, Piotr Skarga Association had some problems. The Episcopate was uh, mm, moving away from them, uh, turning away from them, because mainly because of the way they uh, uh, make their fundraising. They are very aggressive. It's always about first, about uh, the first step would be here always to obtain the um, databases were of the uh, uh, people going to church. So like the, the current uh, president of the Foundation of Ordo Juris, Juris in Poland, he is also a president of another organization that is responsible for a uh, database of the uh, um, people um, from the Polish church. So this allows uh, having these addresses and names, they know who to address and they can send like, I don't know, some tokens of appreciation, etc. for small money. And uh, the Episcopal, the church, really said uh, this is uh, a kind of abuse that's uh, 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 it's not uh, allowed, it's not legal. So people uh, were coming to Episcopal saying that all the time they get this kind of correspondence and letters and they don't want to get it. And, um, and Da then, in 2016, uh, Ordo Juris was uh, promoting the action against abortion. These were the, uh, this was the moment of the first protests in Poland. Back then, the church still had problems with uh, this association because the old organizations thought that um, we, we have to convince society not to go for abortion. These were the, this was the reasoning of the old uh, organizations. So the church was somehow, you know, had this kind, suffered from this kind of duality, whether to support or be against them. Whereas in 2019, during uh, uh, elections uh, here in Poland and uh, Euro elections as well, so it was the year of the mass attack against LGBT people. And uh, they were using really various tricks, uh, dirty tricks coming from, coming from Russia, propaganda. And in 2019, church was not that strong uh, opposing uh, these activities. And uh, as you can see, it's a certain process. In the past, church uh, um, had some kind of strategic thinking, reasoning, I even don't know how to call it, but it was lost somehow. And uh, nowadays, uh, um, church is in this very humiliating position because these organizations imposed a certain language and narrative uh, on church as well. And following these events, uh, well, uh, following the invasion of Russia on Ukraine, or following the uh, scandals in Poland, uh, with the participation of representatives of Ordo Juris, uh, where um, organizations simply uh, collapsed because there was uh, a big uh, uh, scandal, love affair of the uh, top figures in uh, Ordo Juris. So as a result of all this, uh, some uh, sentiments changed, or the Juris uh, and similar milieus would uh, have bigger impact in Poland, or uh, the impact is somehow limited. Well, after the uh, outbreak of war, let me start, start with facts. In fact, they have they suffer from some uh, financial problems. They had some problems to pay money to people. They had to cut some. Uh, or they, they had to uh, reduce uh, headcount in the office, and you can see they have problems. You can see that, uh, well, just after the outbreak of war, their activities was quite were quite standard, whereas in the recent months, you can see the uh, results of the weakening of their position. Uh, but what they do, they usually have to uh, have lawyers. They write actually. Uh, they they um, in, initiate uh, litigations in church. They organize some petitions online. 
uh, they uh, all the time convince people to sign up their petitions, etc. So they use all these public mechanisms to make a lot of rumor around them. Recently, it is less of this activity visible. So I'm uh, happily following this. And in the uh, begin, and uh, sorry, in the uh, end of the uh, of the last year, they said they uh, they said they are on this brink of uh, existence or non-existence. So, but in fact, they are still active. However, I have the feeling that they are not as harmful as they used to be before. Of course, there is a mm, huge. Um, um, election campaign ahead of us and maybe they would get money from the state, public money, to strengthen them. So it's really, uh, now we are in a moment uh, which is very important. We should follow the, uh, and observe what they do. If we were to name the most spectacular or the most harmful actions organized in Poland by Ordo Juris, Definitely, it would be a campaign against the uh, right for abortion, uh, some other public campaigns, or um, the campaign um, abolition of the uh, right to stop violence in the family. Yes, they want to uh, step down from the uh, Istanbul Convention, uh, the uh, Istanbul Convention, Tur Turkey, Mm, uh, already left this coalition. Poland was among the same uh, group of countries. It was put on hold. Uh, it uh, faced a lot of criticism. And uh, Jobro, our Minister of Justice, was uh, in deeply involved in that. This topic was somehow um, let go. They, uh, I don't know why uh, they stopped uh, acting on that. It was simply a accumulation of things that uh, simply um, resulted from the fact that the uh, uh, Minister of Justice at the same time is the General Prosecutor in Poland. This is the same person. This is the Polish aberration. So Ziobro is also a head of party, the party that in the most visible way is the uh, pro uh, or uses the pro-Russian tactics. This is this pro most actually pro-Russian uh, milieu, so the most contamin uh, contaminated uh, environment. That's why uh, this um, leaving the convention was actually one of the flagship projects of them. But we also have other problems. Uh, we have problems with structural funds, EU funds to uh, restructure Poland after COVID, etc. Maybe actually there were too many problems that uh, Jobro had, and that's why he stopped working on the convention, Istanbul Convention, and he took care of other topics. He's, uh, okay, maybe you ladies and gentlemen would like to comment on anything or ask questions right now. If there are no comments or interventions, of course you'll have uh, floor later as well. Let me just say again that the idea related to uh, leaving the uh, Istanbul Convention aimed at uh, introduction of an idea, phenomenon, that a single act of domestic violence should not be treated as a violence. Uh, uh, by the way, on your Twitter, I've seen information about uh, the uh, uh, entity uh, right uh, uh, activity similar to Ordo Juris acting in Paris was closed down. Oh, that was the uh, organization run by one of the oligar oligarchs, uh, Vladimir Nikunin. Who is the uh, well Putin's Stalin, uh, uh, Putin's uh, sorry uh, friend from his studies, and um, it was speculated that uh, he might become the uh, well uh, Putin's uh, follower. Uh, um, but he had such an organization in Paris. He also had another organization in uh, Berlin. But uh, since the beginning of war, this uh, organization ceased to exist. I was, uh, oh, they had many pictures and uh, uh, activities in social medias, but uh, all this was uh, removed uh, still before the war. Uh, in case of uh, Akunin's Berlin Foundation, it was already in November 
uh, removed from uh, uh, internet. Uh, in case of Paris, one it happened later, so they were getting ready actually to uh, stop this organization work. Uh, uh, there is another organization because Russians love actually to extend their propaganda, propaganda through um, semi-cultural organization. There is another such organization acting in operating in Paris. They also lost their uh, seat in Paris, so they don't have any physical place and a physical lo location. I'm uh, 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 getting their newsletter, so I'm observing this, uh, following it with great satisfaction. Um, before, they organized many face-to-face -face questions. Now they uh, offer only recordings, and there is always a note that if you want to join our meeting, they rent some uh, space, but this space will be indicated only once you get registered for enrolled for this meeting. So it, they, they act in a way, to, to, to a certain extent, in a secret way. So uh, in this organization, some things also happened. They say they also do not have money, they don't have people. Ordo Juris mainly uh, brings uh, lawyers together. One of the law lawyers, uh, um, Jerzy Kwaśniewski, and his law office is uh, servicing many institutions of culture, like uh, uh, the Contemporary Art Center or the National uh, Art Gallery Zahenta, uh, but many other state-owned organizations as well. And they were always threatening with um, the litigations. litigations. They were uh, running such an online campaign informing that uh, somebody is, uh, for instance, undermining or challenging the good faith of uh, um, uh, the Pope, uh, and uh, the, uh, uh, somebody is uh, saying something uh, unpopular about, uh, about the Pope, and uh, the people could have been actually uh, could have uh, informed about these acts or deeds, and they would uh, sue them. So this kind of media activities, uh, announcing some legal acts, etc., uh, uh, was it really, uh, was it really uh, mm, happening, or maybe uh, did they have the true claims that ended up in uh, the lawsuits or not? Well, or the juries? Well, it still happens. It uh, does not only actually refer to individuals. Uh, there is the uh, whole wave of slaps recently the uh, claims or lawsuits that would actually should stop uh, certain journalist activities and it's mainly about the uh, th th this is aimed at journalists uh, these slap suits uh, investigative journalists and they uh, mainly uh, mm, complain about it or the juries follows this trend and uh, for many years I was already laughing because for years they have been actually, uh, I also received from them many um, promises that they would suit me as well, but they never did it. Mm. And so uh, it's been a long process that they sent me certain threats, they, ne they never did, but only after some time I uh, realized what uh, was going on, because I've learned certain things, and I've learned that all these actions to uh, see journalists, see singers, like Doda, the pop singer, actually, she was also uh, sued by them. But these all are strategic actions. It's just about selecting people who are mm, very po popular, that's why they decided actually not to sue me because they thought that I'm not popular enough. And uh, only once I published my book, I uh, was highly ranked in their rankings, but they still did not sue me immediately. So they are choosing, selecting strategic persons. Around these people, you can do a great campaign. And what is this campaign all about? Big names are associated with Ordo Juris. People tend to Google out what Ordo Juris does. Such a campaign is a spin-off for their voters and allows them to gather money because everything costs money. That's how they select, collect money. We have the suit against this uh, sacrilegious journalist or singer supporters pay money. That's how they organize their finances. And then 
which is really key. You should know that the chairperson of Ordo Iuris also has a law firm at the same time. So all the cases that he collects money for as Ordo Iuris are run by the law firm that he owns. Ordo Iuris pays the law firm for running those cases. Money spins, money goes round and round, you could say. What can the other party, us, do? What can journalists, artists do? Who are under attack of Ordo Juris to combat this kind of violence, legal violence? I think that we are doing a lot. Ordo Juris uh, has this nature that it's easy to laugh at them. You don't need to do special things. They are often ridiculed and laughed at. They are the laughing stock of the society. They have this talent to be so serious that are that they are laughable. Artists, journalists, the society laughs at them. They piss people off. So it's happening naturally. There are memes against them around this. Uh, erotic social affair scandal. They were getting the highest reach in their history because their hypocrisy surfaced. You don't have to do much. Journalists should keep an eye on them because these are dangerous organizations. Okay, we can laugh here, but their activities, their plans can be dangerous. We should be mindful of what they are doing. It would be great if we had money to sue them because what we are missing is some active attitude from us also in the legal world. That's the only language that they understand. They don't like it. They suffer a lot when they are sued against. So that would be great. And I think Putin created them. Putin will destroy them. Okay, that might be a good um, end. Two questions, I see. Well, let me share the microphone with you. i o spotkaniu o Janie Pawle II. Jest to ikoniczne spotkanie Jana Pawła II i Gorbaczowa. Od momentu, kiedy upadł komunizm, nic nie zadziało tutaj. Czy jest jakiś plan, co zrobić? W latach 90. lewica w Europie miała jakiś pomysł na siebie. Taki naiwny pomysł, że Prawa kobiety są uniwersalne, są powszechne. Ultraprawica jednak i fundamentaliści prawicowi mają wielki porządek, wiedzą co robią. Lewica nie, mamy bałagę, mamy jakieś programy, ale to nie jest jest marksizm. Tak mi się przynajmniej wydaje. To jest, nie wiem, jak, jak to tutaj wygląda w Polsce, jak, jako obcokrajowiec, nie wiem, jak to tutaj do końca wygląda. Dokąd zmierzamy jednak? Co dalej? Ira w latach 90. miała ten taki prosty cel. Wszystko rozwiązujemy przemocą. Tak się nie za, to się nie zadziało. Nie wiem, czy, czy dobrze się wyrażam, jasno wyrażam. I will speak in Polish and um, it's really translated in English. Well, Looking at our opposition, the situation is the following. The left lost its power because it started focusing on the rights of individuals and not the rights of masses, the rights of classes. Right now this is considered to be a weakness of the left. It's abused, it is used against us because uh, we, well, abortion, that's half of the population perhaps, but, L but LGBT, queer, transgender, right now transgender is what is 
targeted by Putin by our domestic politicians, I think that this year the campaign might be more anti-transgender than anti-LGBT. The right thinks that this is our weakness and that that should hit against it. They do it in a populist manner. They organize their voters, focusing on topics that used to belong to the left, I mean, social topics. Immigrants are taking away our jobs, and we want to have jobs for Poles. Dole for un the unemployed. We want uh, benefits to come for our unemployed. Again, these used to be topics belonging to the left. They consider it to be a weakness of the left. We think it's a civilizational progress. There might be the line that divides us, a line that we should focus on talking, talking about the broadly understood left. Now, in the Polish context, it's even more difficult. The left in the world right now is weak. In Poland, it's even weaker. I don't know how to solve that topic. I think that's more about organizing political parties. And that's not my domain. That's not my oyster. I'm not part of that. But that's how it is perceived by the right. Perhaps, perhaps war will change everything. It may happen. It may change the constellation. It, it could also help us. But right now, it's too early to say. We cannot be certain of that. I think, however, that if we are to think about the future of the world, we have to rethink the current situation. NATO, NATO from the Western perspective, Russia is right because it was threatened by NATO expansion. expansion. I would say, pardon my French, fuck you. Countries in this part of the region were endangered by Russia for decades, and we have the right to say whether we want to be part of, the, of NATO or not. And NATO has nothing to say in this respect. That's exactly the case with Ukraine. It's our choice. We have a violent aggressor, Russia, who is uh, violent against a small country, a weaker country, and at the same time we are still saying that the poor Russia was uh, threatened by NATO, so we are still fa favoring the dangerous aggressor. I'm really angry when I hear the narrative in the left-wing circles in the West. Uh, there is no sensitivity for our context, for our perspective, for our problems. That's something that really irritates me. Again, time and again, we hear it. Of course, it's used and abused by Russia. It fuels Russian argumentation. But it doesn't happen for the first time. Once again, the left is showing its weakness towards Russian propaganda. We've been there. We've had communist parties that were infiltrated. Let me just mention what happened in Italy. And we are right now making the same mistake again, allowing the violent men again to demand to be considered an empire. Let's stop treating Russia as if it was empire. Let it fall apart. It fell apart in 1989. Let it fall apart again, and we will start the world anew. That's what we should be focusing on when organizing our forces. And I think Ukraine can change the history of this century. In the interview for Gazeta Wyborcza, you stated that we lack hope that anything can be done. This was said right in the middle between October 2016 and October 2020. We lack hope that anything can be done. Look at it from today's perspective. Would you still say the same or perhaps something changed and we could be more optimistic? You mean Poland, Polish situation? Yes, I mean, what is happening here? Well, the elections might be some beacon of hope and I think this year will be the year of elections, a big question mark for the time being. We still lack hope, however. Uh, many people I know, many activists are rather in depression right now after this uh, 
vibration and uh, exhilaration at the beginning of 2021. We are in depression. We were protesting against something that we were not able to stop. We failed. And we want to do something about the elections, but we don't know what. There are so many thi things happening around us that are bad. And the scale of theft, of uh, mob, of racketing, creating um, a class of oligarchs in Poland, it's all too visible. And that takes away our hope. I think, however, that the only beacon of hope is elections, but we know perfectly that the elections might not bring us an, a an answer. Uh, it's possible to postpone it again because of, say, the war in Ukraine. The war will be used as a kind of argument that uh, we need to postpone the elections because um, voting will, will be endangered or anything. We see some tricks and gimmicks being done around the system right now to secure their money, their positions. I don't know. I think that right now we can still have more hope. The elections are still in front of us. It's not a deal done yet. But I'm not so super optimistic that we will be able to win the elections. Not that we will not have a majority. I think law and justice is losing voters. They will lose. But there will be some non-democratic ideas that they will come up with just to keep power. For them, it's to be or not to be right now. So they either will be put to jail or they will have to escape the country for the crimes they did and they have to save their future. So it's a, a to be or not to be. And they will do everything to secure themselves. So there's not much hope in what I just said, yes, but we are continuously in between. There are chances, opportunities here and there, and we have to tap into all the potential that we have. Another question? Good afternoon. Could you comment? I just opened the website of the Parliament, but in the next seating, there will be the first reading of the new Act on Protection of Family and the Fetus. The initiator is Krzysztof Kacprzak. Could you comment on that? The reading should take place on the 8th of March, which is the International Women's Day. Why now? Why is that done? It's another very colorful person in the right wing. Milieu is in Poland, Kaja Godek, uh, a female activist, right wing activist. I think that feeds into what you just said, lack of hope. But I wanted to say that indeed something happened. Women are able to cope. Recently I spoke to my friend who lives in the Czech Republic and the help is there. It's possible to get an abortion, but what should happen next week? Would you please comment what is about to happen? Uh, we have an enemy that loves uh, symbols, and they know how to use symbols. I don't remember which year it was, maybe 2017. On some uh, Valentine's Day, they introduced a ban on uh, buying uh, uh, day after pills uh, in, a drug, in uh, pharmacies. So they love these important dates, symbolic dates. So if, uh, uh, if it says that they're going to have this reading between 7th and 9th of March, definitely they would do it on the 8th of March, the International Women's Day. Of course, this initiative was raised and uh, uh, it has to be recognized. They have deadlines. Officially, peace, uh, the Law and Justice Party says they're not going to um, have a position on that. Um, 
they recently or before that they were not able to um, come up with the stringent uh, regulations on abortions. They sent this act to the uh, tribunal, uh, constitutional court, as in the U.S. Uh, this was the Supreme Court that actually uh, decided on that. So there is only one case where you can go for the abortion and have an abortion, but uh, following this new law, uh, even this one case would be a band. I don't know if you can believe in what Peace is saying. Uh, they said they are not they are not going to support this pro uh, this draft, this law. But let's imagine that they would support it on the 8th of March. In six months, uh, they would go for elections. And after the last ban on uh, the abortion uh, law, they lost certain percentage points in the, among their own electorate. Even some elderly ladies from the countryside, uh, and usually these ladies are, you know, the core electorate. But if they decided to be stupid and vote for it, uh, we would end up in a situation that would even uh, uh, be better for us. It would lead us for the victory in, um, in Argentina, where they had uh, even more problems and more issues to solve. There were big uh, women's protests and mobilization of uh, women led to the election of the uh, left, uh, part, uh, left uh, government that legalized abortion in Argentina. So maybe let them make these mistakes. Uh, uh, maybe this would help us to uh, win something here. Uh, the worst thing in this situation is that in the, the, you know, in during the times in between these two laws, uh, to be, uh, before the introduction of the new law, we may see some victims because anti-abortion law uh, ends up in many tragic uh, situations and some women uh, die if they don't get the right to go for abortion, if their life is uh, threatened, if uh, mm, women die of uh, sepsa because the um, that uh, fetus is not removed from their bodies and the pregnancy is not terminated. To takie pytanie, przemyślenie. Kiedy to było? 2015 rok, kiedy się pojawił ten kryzys? Nawet nie kryzys, ja bym tylko nie nazwał kryzysem. Zanim zaczęli napływać uchodźcy do Niemiec, to zawsze była ta organizacja MPD w Niemczech, zawsze były w tych pewnych partiach niemieckich takie prawicowe tendencje. I po roku 2015 staliśmy sobie sprawę, że to zawsze, że zawsze tak naprawdę pojawiała się taka ignorancja po lewej stronie. No, wspomnieliście Państwo to, że się wyśmiewa tam, że ludzie wyśpiewali Ordo Juris, tak? No, też miałem taką trochę e, refleksję, że może tutaj też jest taka ignorancja lewaków. E, może to nie jest dobre. Those who were laughing at Ordo Juris, these are not only represented, uh, this is not only the representation of the left. Even in their own conservative milieus, they are somehow uh, ridicule, they uh, are laughed at. We have the example of the politicians who were one of the main uh, representatives of uh, conservatives in Poland, uh, Sikorski, who is against, strongly against the Ordo Juris, and he was also sued by Ordo Juris. They meet in the court, they fight against each other because Sikorski believes that uh, they are the total aberration of conservatism. They destroy conservatism. So it's not only about uh, left people. It's not our ignorance. They are ridiculous, simply. They are bizarre. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe this may be the most optimistic <laughs> aspect of this conversation. Uh, I would like to thank you very much for your participation. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for this lecture. Let me add one more thing. I understand you're from Germany. Maybe 
in May, my book will be published in Germany as well. A shortened version, um, um, but updated uh, by some aspects created by the or triggered by the war uh, in Ukraine. So you would be able to read all the stories behind. Uh, I was writing books, articles. Uh, I was. Uh, Publishing a lot of things. We have to talk about all these, yes, about all this, all, all, about this war. And I started to write a script for the movie. I thought maybe movie would be the uh, so a documentary. You mean? Yes, I'm working on a script for a documentary movie. So we are waiting. We can't wait for it. Thank you.